Good day, Colin. First of all, let me thank you for agreeing to share with our audience today some of your experiences. But before we launch into the things that you would like to talk about, could you give our audience a little bit of background about yourself and then maybe include, you know, why are we here? How did we get here? What are we trying to do? Absolutely, Guy. Thanks so much for having this conversation. My name is Colin Hahn. I am the Learning and Organizational Development Manager at Douglas Dynamics, which is a company that manufactures work truck equipment, um, does work truck upfitting, so very much a manufacturing sort of environment. Before that, my career was uh, came through the academic space. I actually thought I was going to be a university professor, ended up getting into training and development through soft skills training around communication skills, leadership, that sort of thing. And now I carve out my space around the intersections of talent strategy, performance improvement, and people data. And we're having this conversation because as I've been getting more into thinking about how to help our business really achieve business goals, as opposed to just doing a bunch of training activity, the tool set from the performance improvement field has been really helpful for me. And you've been very generous with your time helping to share some of your experiences and lessons along the way in order to build up that skill set. And so now we're talking about some of the fruits we've seen from some of those earlier conversations. Well, thank you for that. So uh, you've got some success stories uh, that you would like to share with us about your journey and uh, some of the applications and such. So uh, I believe there's three of them. There may be more. You can uh, share whatever you'd like. But uh, what have you got for us today? Yeah. So one of the places where I look to apply some of these techniques was in technical training. Uh, as an organization, we are working on getting more people comfortable with Power BI and building out that skill set through organization. And if I think about how I would have approached that from my traditional instructional design training, it would have been very focused around, let's map out all the knowledge that people have. It's really focused on a content piece of it. And I knew just from having started to learn Power BI on my own that this was quickly going to become overwhelming and really difficult to deliver something in a timely manner, really difficult to deliver something that was going to make an impact for the organization. And so I thought that this was an opportunity to really try putting some of these techniques into practice. And instead of starting with a content focus on, okay, what do people need to know in order to use Power BI effectively? Let's, let's flip that question to what's the job to be done? So what what's the performance challenge here? What are the outputs that we're going to be generating? And so by working with my uh, stakeholders, we were able to define out the problem a little bit more. And this is where some of those tools around performance modeling, identifying what the target audience data is, became really helpful because we realized very quickly that there was a radical difference between what you needed to know if you were someone who just was consuming reports that someone else had generated. And so, you know, the errors that you need to avoid are, you know, reading a number and forgetting that you had a filter over or in a different place that was affecting that number, right? That's a, that's a very different skill set than if you're the person who's actually doing the data modeling or if you're the person within IT that is figuring out which of the data sets are blessed and other people can be accessing or making sure that those folks know what the limitations on those data are, those sorts of things. And so by starting with defining what is the target audience for this, what are the, the different jobs that each of those groups are doing, how would we know that they were successful, then we gave a lot more structure to that than the traditional content-focused way of here's everything that you can do in Power BI and let's go through your traditional you know, report in a day training. And what I was amazed to discover as I went through this process was, first of all, just how fast it was. Uh, I was really concerned going into this that there'd be a lot of conversations we needed to have in order to identify these different groups and then try to map out all of these different pieces here. And actually, you know, it was a relatively simple conversation with the stakeholders to say, let's find a couple of our master performers, a couple of representatives from each of these different groups, you know, do a little bit of brainstorming 
brainstorming on what sort of roles we might be trying to fill here and then get that group together in a facilitated group process. We ended up meeting virtually and spent a couple of hours hammering out what is the typical performance model look like for this? What are the main areas of performance? And let's get down enough detail here so we understand what we're talking about and where some of the challenges are. And what that process delivered for us was not only did it speed up that instructional design process, and not only did it make sure that we were working on things that were actually going to have an impact on the business outcomes instead of just being a spread of information for everyone, but not once in that entire conversation did I have people pushing back saying like, oh yeah, but folks need to know this. Like that that typical bogey person of, you know, any subject matter expert, which is, well, you know, this is important information. So they need to know this. So we just, we didn't have problems with that because we kept focusing on, so what's the deliverable here? How would we know if it's a good one or not? And, and all of a sudden those questions of, well, they need to know this random thing about this you know particular feature just disappeared from us. The other thing that was really helpful for this is if we would have started off just designing a training solution and deploying it to the organization, we would have discovered about three months later that we weren't in a position for people to leverage that because we didn't have a shared understanding among different groups about what our data governance philosophy was going to be as an organization. And so we would have had a situation where people had invested time in training, right, been really excited about being able to use some of these skills, and then they would have gone and tried to create some of their own reports and they would have realized that they don't have access to this data or that... Um, there wasn't capacity of the IT team to build out the data set for them or that for whatever reason, right, they weren't going to be able to share that data with other folks in a way that would make those reports usable. And so by identifying that there's some environmental barriers that we need to deal with here, we need to get aligned on uh, some of our data governance issues and come up with a solution to that before it even makes sense to roll out training to folks. Uh, I, I think we managed to save ourselves a lot of different heartache that could have happened. Very cool. Very cool. So what's the system here? Uh, uh, explain that to people because they may not understand, you know, what, what, what you were training on. Yeah, so Power BI is an analytics tool that Microsoft offers. Um, it is designed to allow people to do a lot of different manipulation and in business intelligent type calculations. And so the, the basic idea we went into is that we want people to be using more data. We want them to be able to get better information, right? Really good and noble goals for the organization. But in order to do that, you've got to make sure that your data is clean. You've got to make sure that you've got things modeled appropriately. Um, and you need to understand that not everyone is going to be a data modeler. It also doesn't make sense to try to train everyone to get to the master level of this. If you've got someone who is you know, working in your supply chain and just needs Needs to get visibility into which suppliers are consistently missing their deadlines. And that's a very different skill set than if you're the person who's saying, we've got all of this supplier performance data that we need to integrate, we need to normalize, we need to figure out how we do our time and intelligence calculations around that. And so there were very different needs of these target audiences that when we started to get into what does success look like in these particular roles and who's got responsibility for this? Is that really the responsibility of the person who's consuming the report to understand what the limits of the data are? Or is that something that the author of the report needs to inform the people who have access to it? Hey, here's what you can do and here's what you can't do. Um, and then that's not a, a training issue. That is, you know, how do we make sure that people are onboarded to this data set properly? And so, again, we started to draw out that there's not just knowledge and skill gaps here. There's issues issues of role clarity, there's issues of accountability, there's issues of the performance environment, of the information that's available. And so again, it would have been really easy for this to become just, here's everything that you need to know about data, go. And that would have been incredibly overwhelming for everyone. So what kinds of results or reports have you had from uh, the stakeholders and the, the, the trainees? 
Yeah. So what we're seeing so far is that there's a couple of people within the organization who've actually been doing a fairly good job on their own of creating reports that people have been using to identify issues around like supplier performance. So we're able to improve having parts on hand so that we're not shifting schedules at the last minute um, or identifying where we've got clusters of safety issues, for instance, um, things like that. Um, we've started getting into some of our HR data where we're now looking at, you know, turnover or like performance gaps across different locations, being able to start getting some insight into where we might have culture challenges, where we might have engagement struggles, those sorts of things. And, and again, as an organization, we realized that we weren't ready to go full into having, you know, data available to everyone and having all of these curated data sets. And so instead of investing a lot of effort in something that would have been useless, honestly, one of the biggest benefits of this approach so far is that we've said, we don't have bandwidth to take this on right now. Let's focus on the things where we actually can move the needle for the organization. Because if we wouldn't have taken this sort of approach, and just would have worked with the stakeholders, you know, not even as order takers, but just as your traditional consultative, you know, addy content, you know, generation, we would have been in a situation where four months from now, we wouldn't have seen any business impacts and we would have invested a lot of people's time into developing these resources. And so right now we've been able to have really good conversations with a lot of our partners through the organization on, we can't move the needle on this piece right now. So what else can we do or where else should we be allocating people to projects so we can have an impact on our business's results? And just avoiding the wasted work has been such such a, a rewarding experience here to be able to say to the organization that as responsible stewards of all of the resources that you have available, this actually isn't the thing to do right now. And here's why. Let's figure out what would be a better use of those people resources. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so <clears throat> so you've got another you got another couple of uh, experiences to share? Absolutely. So uh, the next experience, I think, really illustrates how this can be helpful in not only accelerating the development process, but also avoiding a lot of the mistakes that typically happen when you have new instructional designers. So we were working on some training on accountability. Uh, we have a lot of people on our front lines that one of the constant complaints from supervisors is that you know, people don't feel accountable for their work. They don't feel like um, you know what they do matters, that sort of thing. And so like, any good you know, person who is new to the organizational development space, like when some of our team members are, they're given this task and they start saying, okay, let's research everything that we can find about the accountability competency. And after you know, a check-in meeting uh, to see how this you know, design effort is going, quickly realized this was becoming your standard college lecture on accountability is important. And here's you know the Harvard Business Review stats about like when people feel accountable, they do this much more stuff. And I'm imagining that class being delivered to a group of our shop floor associates and just the eyes rolling as people are like, oh my God, this corporate guy is talking down to us again. Like th this would have been a, a disaster of a class to deliver. And it's not because the person who was researching this class was finding things that were inaccurate or wrong, but it wasn't targeting a problem that our audience had, right? If I'm talking to a supervisor, then a class on accountability is how do you set expectations with that audience and how do you follow through when those expectations are violated, right? So success is that people are meeting their expectations. Um, they are uh, coached when they don't meet those expectations, right? We're, we're doing things in order to make sure those expectations and that accountability uh, happens, right? That's very different than if our target performer is someone who is working on the shop floor, right? Because we're not telling them to go and be accountable, right? What we need to understand is, well, what are they trying to deliver there and, and where does the lack of accountability fit into that? 
And so this is where that performance modeling process was really useful for us because we started saying, well, if I'm a shop floor associate, what, what am I doing? What's, what's the product? What's the output that I'm uh, delivering here? And so let's say that one of those outputs is hitting my daily metrics around safety, uh, quality, delivery, cost, right? Then we can start saying, well, there's a lot of tasks there and we're not getting into the job specific version of here's what a welder does around that or here's what a you know press break operator does but we can say that there's a pattern here across the shop floor that some of these numbers are not being achieved and one of the reasons we see that happening is because people are not helping out when others are struggling so then we can do a five whys type of analysis and say, okay, so, well, why aren't they helping out? And one of the answers we come up with is because other team members aren't making it, aren't asking for help. And then we say, well, why aren't they asking for help? Well, there's a lot of things that we could say there that, you know, people feel embarrassed about asking for help. They feel like it'll make them look bad. They feel like others aren't willing to help. And so then we started to say, okay, if our, you know, gap in performance here is that people are not asking for help um, or the offers for help aren't being accepted if they are being extended, right? Well, what can we do to make it easier for team members to ask for help? And now this class, which is still in a very incohate form at this phase, but this is starting to look very different because telling a shop floor associate, you should be accountable, right, is immediately oppositional. But if we're now structuring a class around, hey, how can you make it easier for your team members to ask for and accept help? Well, that's something that is a lot more motivating, a lot more engaging, a lot less you know, oppositional. Um, and it's something that can address a real performance deficit, right? And so now we can start thinking about, well, what would this look like? And, and I love your question. So what would authentic practice with feedback look like? And so this is a place where we said, so if we were to actually practice making it easier for someone to ask for help, like what would they be doing? And that would probably be that the person is checking in on their team member to see how things are going. It's probably that they're you know, saying, hey, is there anything I can do to help? There's probably some elements of the body language and the tone of voice there um, that are going to be pretty important. And so now we're starting to work in a backwards design where if we need people to you know, be able to have that conversation and we know what authentic practice and feedback looks like, well, that's something that we can have them do in a classroom setting. And then we start working back further. Okay, do they need to have a demonstration of what success looks like here? And so now we're starting to shape up some instructional activities. Like maybe we have the facilitator role play a really bad offer for help. So, you know, walking over gruff saying like, hey, you need any help with that? Like, well, obviously you do. Like, why aren't you asking for it? And, and we can get the class to draw, okay, why was that a bad example of the behavior that we're trying to illustrate and have them do a fix it, right? And then we say, all right, so now you can pair up and try that with a partner so that you're getting some of that authentic practice and feedback. And, and then we ask, so what do they need to know in order to be able to make sense of that demo, right? Is there information that they need to provide beforehand? And all of a sudden, all of those factoids from Harvard Business Review about the value of accountability, we, we realize like, that's not actually what's critical for this learning experience here. And again, I the person who is developing this class is someone who's pretty new to the instructional design world. So this was a learning opportunity here. If I think about the different expectations that people have on how long it takes to design instructor-led training. I think the current, you know, average is that, you know, budget 40 hours for every hour of classroom training. And this is a new team member. So, you know, saying 40 is probably optimistic there. If we were doing traditional instructional design, right, I'm expecting this is a 60 to 80 hour investment of this person's time. But, you know, we had a couple of hours invested in the front end to define what the problem was and, you know, what, what the ask is from our audience, right? And then 
I gave it to this designer, had him go and do some development work. We did his great research on all of your accountability factoids, right? A couple of hours there that, you know, we ended up going in the wrong direction, but that's fine. We had a check-in. We were able to recalibrate. Um, and then we started doing this performance mapping process and really identifying like what are the the barriers to success here what it you know what does authentic practice with feedback look like and doing that reverse chaining process where it's what's the application do they need to see a demo do they need an info here and all of a sudden we had you know what was an hour long class that we realized that now this is actually probably two different skill sets and so we've got two hours of instruction which means in the traditional model I, with a new performer I'm thinking that I should be spending 120 hours in order to get the design and development done, but we ended up spending less than 10 hours on mapping out the entirety of the, the class, knowing what the timeline was going to be, what the activities were going to be, right? Total time investment was between 10 and 20 hours before we go and start building PowerPoint slides. And honestly, that is not going to take you know, hundreds of hours of time. And so I look at how much this accelerated the cycle time for us to be able to get training in front of our target audience. And it was absolutely incredible to see just how this transformed that experience. Again, for someone who's brand new to the instructional design world, and I would expect to take a long time and it just crushing the industry norm. Yeah, that's. I think that focus when you're anchored to performance, it really streamlines a lot of things you can see immediately whether it fits or not or whether it's really you know critical or extraneous uh you know it's an interesting factoid as you say but uh you know it's got really no relevance here it's not gonna really help move any of the needles but uh thank you for sharing that i i it'll be interesting to see how others and your staff you know glom onto this and uh what where they might take it themselves uh that's always a, 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 an interesting thing to watch because I've I've done that myself over the decades. But uh, thanks. Uh, so uh, what's what's your next story? Your experience. Yeah. So the next example is going to get into a, a project that's currently in flight. So we're we're not going to be at the end of the process here, but I can talk a little bit about how things are shifting already at the beginning. Um, and this is a leadership training program for our leads on the shop floor. We have, you know, a couple hundred people across the organization that are the ones that are supervising the work on a day-to-day -day basis. There's a lot of variety in what these roles look like, and there's a lot of different expectations that are on these folks. And if we're trying to map out everything that a lead needs to know in order to be successful, ooh, I, I don't know if we'd ever get done with this program. And so part of what we need a way to do is to create a shared understanding of priorities among our different stakeholders. And, and this is where the areas of performance uh, approach was really helpful for us as we were having some of these group conversations about what are we trying to do here? Because it was relatively easy for the group to come up with a long list of things that you know leads do on a daily basis. But then we zoomed out and we started saying, well, what are they actually responsible for here? What are what are the big buckets of major responsibilities of their work? And we started to get things like, you know, they're managing the daily work. So they're updating the you know daily or hour by hour tracker boards. They're assigning labor in different places. They're identifying what jobs are coming up next, right? There's that bucket. There's responding to issues on the floor, right? That part doesn't fit. We realized we're out of stock of this, right? Whatever it is. There's doing formal problem solving. There's some of their day where they're using techniques, uh, you know, like the five whys or, you know, maybe some other lean techniques in order to be able to address problems uh, so that they won't happen again. Right? And there's other another bucket of responsibility about escalating the work appropriately when it's something that's outside of your control, right? So you might need to work with an engineer in order to um, you know, get uh, approval for a variance, or you might need to you know, reach out to your supply chain person in order to 
find out when you're going to have more parts in stock, things like that. And so as we started mapping out these areas of performance, uh, one of the really interesting things here was that as much as there was a lot of variety in the work that the leads did, um, we started thinking about what is the ideal version of a lead's responsibilities look like? And if we were to say, you know, ballpark, what percentage of their time should we expect to be spending on fighting fires versus managing the work versus training and coaching team members? All of a sudden, we got a lot clearer understanding of what the success at that role looked like. And I think one of the things that was a struggle is just not clarity of expectations between managers and their leads. And so quickly, we got a framework where we can say, all right, you know, we want you to be spending less time you know, jumping in and working on the line. I don't know exactly what that looks like, but if you're closer to 50% of your time rather than 10% of your time, we've got a problem there. We've got to, we've got to address it. Um, it's not going to be zero percent. We want to be realistic here, but we were able to give some really helpful guidance. And even before we designed the training program, all of a sudden the people who were in that framing conversation started going back to their team members and saying, hey guys, I, I think I can give you a little bit more direction about where you should be spending some time or where you shouldn't be spending some time. And so already we're seeing that there's some behaviors that are changing as a result of being able to get that clarity there. Again, not all performance gaps are because of a knowledge or skill deficiency. Sometimes it's having a lack of clarity around expectations. Sometimes it's having a lack of information. And so sometimes the supervisors didn't even know where their leads were spending time. Now they're able to ask, hey, like, what was taking up your time today? Where were you spending? What weren't you able to get to? Let's talk about how we're prioritizing those things. And so already before we even have a training solution, we're starting to get improvements on the shop floor just because we've encouraged people to have the right sorts of conversations. Um, beyond that, right, uh, as we are continuing this design process and we're getting more into the, not just the big areas of performance, but what actually happens within those where the skill deficits, those sorts of things. Again, it would have been so easy for folks to say, here's all the things a lead should know. And I'm shocked at how much we're not getting that conversation. We've just avoided the problem entirely because people are really focusing on what, what are they delivering for us as an organization? What does success look like? What sort of things do they need to be able to do for that? And, and being able to say, hey, in this particular division, right, that task might be owned by a lead in another division that might be owned by the supervisor. And so using sort of the, the roles piece to figure out who's actually accountable for that getting done has been really helpful for figuring out, okay, this is something that we know every lead is going to see. Here's some stuff that's more situational. And so even without having written the entire program yet, we already know that we've got some very easy ways to customize this. So it's going to be relevant for that particular audience. And then we're not trying to do a one size fits all solution. Well, yeah, great. Thank you. I, yeah, the, again, the focus on performance really just clears the decks of a lot of uh, interesting uh, facts or, you know, when you're when people are focused on what you got to know uh, instead of what you got to do, it really gets to be a long list of, of everything under the sun where, you know, the, some of those things really aren't top priorities and not really critical to people's ability to perform. Um, so one of the things that I'm always interested in is, and I've been suggesting this for a long time, is, you know, adopt what you can and adapt the rest. So I'd be interested in knowing of the methodologies and tools and techniques and such that you've gotten from me, what were some of the key things that you really adopted you know, pretty much as perhaps I've given you, if anything, because maybe not. And, and what things did you find it necessary to adapt and, and why was it necessary to adapt it? Because I think it is necessary often to adapt things, but it's not necessarily clear to people how they should might think about any of that. What can you yeah. share? It, it's definitely a work in progress. Uh, one of the things that I really appreciate about the approach you have and really laying things out in terms of, you know, almost what the process is, what are the outputs at each step. It's very concrete. 
it was easy as I was first going through some of your books to be overwhelmed by that because there's a lot of different outputs there and a lot of granularity. And so the first place where I adopted and just said like, this piece absolutely clicks for me was the performance model. Being able to shift the conversation from what do people need to know or what should they know in order to be successful in this job to now, what do they need to do? And be, uh, I, I think that the framing there of how it sets up that conversation, right? You've got the outputs and how you know whether the output is a good or bad one. Awesome, right? What are the key tasks there? Absolutely. The the roles piece of it might be relevant in some situations, might not. It's been great for that you know lead example. It was great for clarifying that uh, Power BI situation. Um, it you know other situations may not be as relevant because you've got a very unified target audience. Fair enough, right? Um, being able to think about where are the performance gaps, where are the common mistakes, and being able to classify those. Okay, is that really a knowledge skills issue, or is that an issue where you've got a broken process, or you don't have the right information, or environmental supports, whatever? I think that's been really helpful in advancing the conversations with the stakeholders. So that performance model piece has definitely been a centerpiece of the work that I've been doing. Uh, another piece that I've been taking pretty much uh, from you know your tools directly is uh, the uh, in uh, the instructional lesson map and the instructional activity design. So being able to say, I, I love that question. What would authentic practice with feedback look like in order to figure out what the APO is, and then work back from that. Do they need to see an example of this in order to be able to do it successfully on their own? Okay, that gives us a demo. All right, it, do they need some information in order to be able to understand what's coming at them at the demo? Um, and then layering on those questions: Do they need to try it once? Do they need to try it maybe multiple times? Do we need an example from Hades to go in here? I, I think that's been a really helpful tool. And again, I, I look at how that accountability class shaped up and what could have been, you know, hours and hours of instructional design work um, ended up, you know, coming together. And honestly, we were collaborating over teams and I think it was maybe 45 minutes where we got the entire thing mapped out of the two hour session. It was incredible to see just how quickly it all happened. So those I think have been two real wins for me as just adopt because it works and there's not a whole ton of fiddling that needed to be done. Well, great. Thank you. So that was great. So that was uh, what you, uh, some of the key things that you adopted kind of wholesale uh, as I presented them. Of course, everybody makes adaptations to these things, even when you adopt things. But what are some of the things that uh, in my approach to things that you found it necessary to adapt? And, and what was your situation that that uh, helped you conclude that that's what you really needed to do? Yeah. One of the areas that I was really trying to figure out what to do with was the layered approach of the curriculum architecture design down to the, the modular curriculum development down to the instructional activity. As I thought about this lead development program, it was clear that this is going to be more than just a single learning experience. And so it definitely belonged at least at that modular level. Um, but is it a full on curriculum effort? It wasn't quite clear. And what I ended up doing is taking a look at the way that you had mapped mapped out those processes and thinking about what's the output of each of these and what is that feeding into? Why do I need to do that piece of it? And so as I was doing that, I started to think about what that would make sense like in this particular context. And, you know, there's some aspects of the curriculum architecture that I ended up keeping. There's other places where I said, hey, that's overkill for this. There's a couple of the outputs that ended up, you know, consolidating together. And so it was one piece there, or maybe it wasn't even necessarily a, a formal document output, but I made sure that I knew what I was trying to get out of some of the activities in those phases so that I had an answer to those questions, or I had something that I was able to, to point to just for my own reference to make sure I had limited the uncertainty going forward. Uh, 
Um, and so that's a, a big place is just understanding that, you know, if you're, I, I hear think about some of the projects that you've talked about where you're mapping out, you know, hundreds of job families with, you know, thousands of knowledge skill elements. And when you're working on a project of that scale, and I'm assuming with like a relatively large team, because yeah, I don't think you spent your entire career on that one project, right? Um, I'm, I'm willing to bet that there's a lot of coordination that needs to happen. And so having all of those pieces documented in a consistent way and having something that different people can jump in and know what they're staring at um, is really helpful. You know, for this lead development project, uh, there's a project leader who also is doubling as an instructional designer. We've got a couple of other of uh, the talent development resources that are available there, but it's it's not a giant group of people. And so, you know, having it all at that level of formality where if we were doing, you know, a 20 person design team, we would need, it, it just didn't make sense. And so understanding, you know, these tools exist for a reason. What is that reason? And do I need a tool at this level of sophistication or do I just need to be able to competently answer this particular question? That's been a, a place where, you know, I'm continuing to learn about when those things are relevant and, and when they aren't, but I've managed to, at least so far, avoid being paralyzed by like, oh my gosh, there's so much paperwork to do here. Uh, I, I can imagine right, seeing all these things and thinking like, wow, this seems like there's just a, a lot of paperwork here. Like, why would you want to adopt this method? My experience has been that if you understand what's essential to the particular project you're doing, this methodology actually accelerates things dramatically. And it doesn't require you to go and document a bunch of things just for the sake of paperwork. It's, you know, when you get to a scale where you've got to manage that sort of uncertainty or ambiguity or whatever, right, that is able to create some clear handoffs. But if you don't have that need, then you don't need it at that level. Yeah, that's very true. I think that, uh, you know, some of my larger projects uh, you know, I was taking 188 days of existing training and we were going to displace it. That's what the client wanted. This was for call center employees uh, that had to deal with 50 different sets of state regulations that they had to comply with. So um, and the intent was is that when we were done with the design, when we were done with the curriculum architecture design, laying out, you know, the end to end cradle to grave learning journey for particular jobs. Once we got past the design, we were going to jump right into developing it. So we were going from curriculum architecture design into modular curriculum development. Um, and we were going to have 20, 30 different people doing the development. Um, and they, we needed to control this because one of the things I learned early in my career is that if I didn't really have people oriented to what they were going to do, as well as to what everybody else was going to do, they would do me a favor by building in things that they saw were missing because they didn't realize that that was going to come before or later on the path. Mm -hmm. And And so the paperwork was really intending to kind of you know, if you're going to a, a create a big, huge a machinery system with a bunch of different components, and there was going to be some variations on that with different functionality, you know, there's shareable content and there's unique content. And so one of the things was to carve all that out so you could divide and conquer the development of this, in our case, instructional content. Mm -hmm. But, but yeah, so that, and so um, the bigger the project, the more complex, the more politics in an organization, the more I found it necessary to document everything so that it was crystal clear. And I'm an external consultant. So, you know, the client, you know, just didn't want us to tell people things and then it never got written down. So in order to uh, provide the client with what they needed after me and my organization left, you know, they, I needed to leave them with a paper trail that they could carry forward and continue to do the development and modify existing content or create brand new content where they didn't have it. So, but I think that that's an important thing is that part of the formality of your project and your own deliverables in how detailed your documentation is varies depending on your context. And, you know, if we got a tight knit group and they're going to, you know, be a part of the process and then they're going to 
divvy up the work and go do it with a full understanding of what's the totality of what we're creating. And I've got my pieces of it. Um, that le needs a lot less documentation. But in my case, as an external consultant, I wasn't really sure about how soon the client would jump on the development because I always did uh, a lot of the analysis and design and then handed things off to the client. And they'd bring me in every two years to do that for them so their staff would have something to work on. They used mm -hmm. to joke about that. But but so they needed that because there were people who were going to be developing content that weren't even on board on the payroll you know, when we did the analysis and design. So they were come, dropping into something and we needed to provide them with that full picture you know, the, the globe, and then here's the, you know, down to the state and county and village maps so that they could figure out where they were in this whole thing. But so I think that the whole formality, uh, it, sometimes that puts people off the formality of the process and the documentation, and it shouldn't, because actually it helps people speed along. And where they sometimes see that is something that's going to slow everything down. It's quite the opposite. Your front end loading, your effort, uh, getting people all aligned and that shared understanding. And then, you know, then you can go rock and roll and, you know, create stuff and test it and, and deploy it. Mm -hmm. uh, anything else that, you, that uh, you, you might have, uh, you see a need to adapt that you could share? There's obviously going to be situational, you know, context for all of this. And so as I was working through that lead development program, I was definitely looking at those management areas of performance and using that as a guide to frame up some of the conversations. But I realized that some of the way that that was grouped and the language there wasn't going to match with the way that we think about their responsibilities in, in our organization. And so, you know, our leads doing stakeholder management, well, like, yeah, they should because they're partnered with the lead of the next business unit down the line and they need to be able to flag like, hey, there's something that's gone wrong. And so you might need to adjust your work schedule for the day or that sort of thing. But they wouldn't have thought of that in that term. And so you know, as I was using those categories, um, it, we ended up defining our own areas of performance that better fit the way that you know, yeah. our audience was conceptualizing of the work and the way that they were thinking about those things falling into buckets. Um, and that's great, right? That that ended up in a place where we were able to have a really great conversation about where do we expect leads to be spending the time? What are the places where we haven't been clear about that expectation? Or maybe we've thrown things at them, but we haven't given them a scope to understand that. And so all of a sudden, this particular piece has monopolized the job, or this piece is something that they're, they're checking the box on, and we actually want them to be spending a lot more time on, right? Being able to frame it in terms of the way that they thought of the buckets of work yeah. was really helpful in having that conversation. I think changing the language and labels is always a critical step. I've done that before. And I've, I've said, my, my, I would introduce some of these concepts and in, in my language and labels and clients might say, well, we call such and such, you know, this. And I'd say, well, then we'll change it. And they go, no, no, don't. I, I like yours better, but but on other ones, they knew that we had to make those changes. It reminds me of uh, doing work with the uh, uh, supervisors and zone managers at the Norfolk Naval Shipyard. And part of my management model is there's a, a portion of it where you're involved in strategic planning. Well, these two levels of management weren't, they didn't have anything to do with the strategic planning efforts, but the zone manager's boss did, and the boss's boss did, and then the one level up is as far as you went. So there were three layers of management above those two, and they were involved in strategic planning, deciding where are we going, what technology is coming our way, how are we going to make changes, all those higher level, uh, executive level, leadership level kinds of things versus first line supervision and their managers. So I think it's always important to take a look at the holistic model, the management model that I have and decide, you know, some of these things aren't appropriate to this level of management, but maybe elsewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, the whole planning of work, you know, that's a kind of a first line supervisor thing. And managers don't often plan the work of their subordinates. They just give them, you know, goals and then let them figure it out. Mm -hmm. And they're not doing any detailed planning. Mm -hmm. So somewhere that might happen should have probably, but in other places it, it's, it's not, it's not really key. And so the whole notion of framing this is to allow you to test out, is this, 
you know, this area of performance, this area of responsibility, this major duty, the key results area, whatever label you give those things, mm -hmm. is this part of this job? Because it may be elsewhere and it may be part of a managerial responsibility, but not maybe at that level. And I, so I think that's key is that, you know, you've always got to use these kinds of models and frameworks, just like I have to test them against, you know, a particular situation and what works with one client for me didn't work with another client. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so when you're working inside an organization, you can kind of grasp that and figure out what fits in your organization best. But when you're going from organization to organization, now you have got lots of different sites. And mm -hmm. so there's a lot of variance across those sites here. And part of the trick is figuring out what, what can we safely generalize and what can't we? You know, mm -hmm. what is the core piece and what are some of the things that are different site to site because of, you know, their particular situation, their context drives them to have jobs assigned to a lead versus a supervisor and vice versa because of their own, you know, manpower levels or whatever the whatever those drivers are, whatever the requirements and constraints are at a particular site. Yeah. Your slash technique has been one of the cheap codes <laughs> that I've used through this. Um, I'm I'm thinking back to uh, one of the conflicts we had between divisions was we've got some divisions that do very standardized repetitive work. And so they have standard work instructions and like your know, official job instructions and, and things like that. I and mean, we've got other divisions that, you know, have a lot more variation in how things are done, how it's captured, how it's taught. And so as we were talking about what leads are doing, one of the things that you know someone threw out in this facilitated group process is they should be keeping the uh, standard work up to date. And immediately, right, there's pushback from the other divisions. And instead of trying to resolve that, right, just being say, hey, so it seems like there's a core idea here around like having some sense of what work needs to be done or how this is you know judged or that like how do you talk about that in your area if you were giving your lead feedback on hey we need to do better at this what would you describe there and just slash 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 just add it all onto the list there and it within you know two minutes you know, what could have been a huge argument between, you know, hey, that's not what the work looks like here. It's like, yeah, they do that. Yeah. Okay, let's keep going. I, I th That's important. So the whole notion of slash is rather than get an argument about whether you call it the or the, you would just go the slash the. And everybody's happy then because their thing, the way they talk about it, their language is represented. And they can go, yeah, it's kind of like that, but it's not the same. That's why I would put the slash in there. So uh, it was it was helpful. There's also the notion of heated agreements where I'd have people just, you know, the West Coast and the East Coast, I used to joke, is arguing about something. And and after about 15 minutes, they go, you mean such and such? And the other person goes, of course, that's what I mean. And they go, they turn to me and then they go, never mind, we're cool. <laughs> and so... So the the you as a facilitator, you need to allow people to express themselves. And sometimes you could, can jump in and help them see that they're talking about the same thing. But other times it's more important that they see that for themselves. And that's a tricky judgment call of facilitator trying to say, do I let some of these things play out? Do I let them play out initially and then kind of jump in and guide and try to ask some clarifying questions to see if they're on the same page, just calling something different? You know, and that, then I've gotten permission to do more of that, to jump in a little bit earlier to help them see, to invite other people in the room into the conversation to see, you know, because when you're in a, a decentralized organization, people have given things names. You call it something, we call it something different, and that's just our local, you know, uh, uh, practices and it's really the same thing. And there's other times, of course, when people use the same language to mean different things, and that's tricky. So the part of the facilitation is to help people do that. And I've had people come out of the facilitated analysis meetings telling me that this was the best training they've ever been in. And what that spoke to is they were learning from each other. They were beginning to understand each other and each other's language 
and where there was where there was similarities and where there were differences, and that was always important. So I, I'm glad you brought that up. Thank you. A anything else, or you know, are we? I got I got a couple. Uh, one more question, but do you have any other adaptations that you think are important to share? Those are the big ones at this point. Uh, I think the big thing that I've been taking away from this is just to understand that each of these tools has a purpose, understand what the overall workflow is, right? Think of it in terms of a process where you've got deliverables and be able to say, you know, in some places, this might be a very tangible, like here's the printout I'm giving you of this model or this map or whatever matrix. Um, there's other places where you're accomplishing that in getting that clarity in a different tool or through a conversation, or you're the only one who needs to have it in your head. And so it can be a couple of random notes in your one note. Uh, it, you know, how you do that is going to adapt, but the, the overall process that you're trying to go through and understanding that this tool is intended to avoid this sort of rework later on, I think has been really helpful for me. Good, good. So um, uh, my final question then is, um, you've, you've been through several of my books you indicated earlier, and I don't know exactly which ones you, you've uh, read and what other articles or videos you've looked at, but uh, off the top of your head, can you identify any of the resources that from me that you might recommend to our audience and then also other resources that you feel are part of your methodology and practices that you've gotten from others and we should help people, you know, we should point people to those as well. Yeah. The first thing from you that I'd point out is uh, Lean ISD. And I put that at the top because, um, first of all, you generously provide the entire thing for free. So thank you. Um, but I, I love how that frames this all in terms of what's the workflow process and you know what are we trying to accomplish with each step here uh, it, it's a really great way for framing this is what we're trying to do and so to, to understand the reason behind these tools if, if you read it just as a checklist of activities I think you're missing a lot of the value of that book where it's really about here's how we should be thinking about things if we're taking a performance improvement mindset. Um, your book on uh, conducting performance analysis through every phase, uh, I forget the exact title, uh, it, it has been really helpful in uh, understanding some of the specific tools there. So the performance modeling aspect, um, the, the way to lay out the instructional activities, all of those pieces, I think that's been a really great uh, way to put that out. If I were to just, you know, force myself to only pick two of your things, those would be the, the two starting yeah. points. Fair enough. Um, there, there's a lot of folks who I've come to appreciate have done some amazing work in this space. And, and one of the things I've tried to do is just continue to expose myself to that and, and continue to, to learn more about that. So you and I were just talking about you know, Carl Binder and I, I love the way that the six boxes are framed up as here's the different types of interventions that we can have and understanding that there's, you know, the, not every intervention is going to be appropriate for every sort of performance challenge. Uh, we, you and I were talking earlier about how that's you know, really built on Tom Gilbert's work. And I think that, you know, just in general, uh, human competence might not be the easiest read, uh, but a, as a, a text that sets out some really valuable ideas, I think it's an incredibly useful resource for, for people to look at. And, and if we in learning and development want to be serious about uh, driving driving business results, I, I don't think we can afford to avoid the work that's been done by these folks who specialize in performance improvement. I think uh, two other names that immediately pop to mind. Um, uh, Bob Mager uh, has a ton of resources uh, it, throughout his books. I think it's analyzing performance problems where he has a really detailed flow chart about why things can go wrong. And if you're coming at this from the perspective of being someone in the training world where you're used to thinking about knowledge and skills gaps, having that sort of model to identify where there's other things that might be missing 
missing from the performance environment, whether it be information, clarity of expectations, right, resources, incentives, any of those things, just having that sort of checklist to run through to say, all right, so if we have them pass a test on this, does that mean that they're going to be successful? If not, like where are the breakdowns here? I think is really helpful for us as we're designing our interventions. Um, and, and the other name that uh, pops to mind right now is uh, Gary Rumler. So um, uh, improving performance, the, the subtitle there about managing the white space of the organization, I, I think is really helpful because a lot of times when I see people who are trying to do uh, training initiatives, right? They they get you know, focused on the job level for what they are teaching, and then they're trying to deliver business results, which is at that organization level. And that missing layer of the processes, I think, connects so many dots. And at least for my thinking, has been really helpful in understanding how we can move the needle and how we can show business impact. Um, even just flashing back from some of our examples earlier, right? I can't tell you off the top of my head what the you know business return on investment is from people who are effective at using Power BI. Um, but I can tell you what the cost to the organization is on developing a training that doesn't end up accomplishing anything. And so I can say we've got some cost avoidance that we've managed to do because we use this process successfully. And so being able to use that sort of tool in order to be able to show the impact that we have on the business, I, I think is a really valuable addition to our skill sets. Well, thank you. Those are all good people. Uh, uh, Carl Binder is kind of a student of Joe Harless and Tom Gilbert. Carl Binder was uh, one of the last graduate students of B.F. Skinner, so he comes from that route. Gilbert was a student of uh, Skinner's. Um, Rumler was a business partner of Gilbert's for a decade back in the uh, 60s and uh, late 60s and late to late 70s. And Bob Mager was he, he was quite a character, but all of those people had this performance orientation. We're trying to avoid, avoid instruction, training, and learning when it wasn't going to have an impact and all developed a lot of similar, uh, they learned from each other because they, as one of, as one of them, the late Joe Harless uh, explained to me, well, we were always competing for the same projects. And then when somebody got the project, they'd hire the rest of us. And so we all worked together and would argue endlessly at dinner and at the bar at night about, you know, you your language is, doesn't work for me. I use this language, you know. And so those are the kinds of things I, I learned from them by listening to them at the bar at conferences back in the day. <laughs> Colin, thank you so much for your willingness to uh, share this uh i wish you well going forward and maybe we can have another conversation about this at some point in the future absolutely i look forward to it and again thank you to you for being so generous with your experience your knowledge your tools all of that i feel like uh, we've got a real opportunity for the learning and development profession to rediscover a lot of these things that you know have been around for a while have a lot of value but for whatever reason um, people that are coming up in the L&D world right now haven't been exposed to a lot of it and I think it really helps round out our skill sets and, and connect a lot of dots that frankly our organizations are asking us to do and so it's going to really help us to be successful and to achieve you know, meaningful results. Yeah, I, I agree. There's a lot of rediscovery that needs to be done because a lot of these things were successfully addressed in the past. But sometimes it involves a little bit of hard work, <laughs> due diligence, and you know, sometimes uh, our clients and and we are in too much of a hurry to get things done rather than uh, uh, get them done so that they truly have impact. Again, thank you so much for for spending some time with me today on this, and I wish you well. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Cheers.